Perfect. Okay. Uh, so tonight, our speaker is Sharon Wander. So Sharon Wander, along with her husband, Wade, uh, are, is a self-employed environmental consultant providing wetland delin delineation, I always have a problem with that word, <laughs> and permitting services and conducting surveys for endangered and threatened species. She has been a long and active New Jersey naturalist interested in birds, uh, reptiles, uh, reptiles, plants and butterflies, as well as moths and other insects. Sharon is a past president of the New Jersey Butterfly Club and served on the 2014 NJDEP committee that evaluated the conservation status of the state butterflies. The Wanderers especially enjoy their Freedom Township Butterfly Garden, which has attracted a state record of 85 species. Okay, and with that, uh, I'm going to make you host, Sharon, and then... We're good to go. Okay. There you go. You should be host. Okay. Uh, more screen. Uh, okay. Share. Okay. Are you, uh, are you getting this as a Oh, I gotta play. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't done this in a while. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. okay. Uh, very good. Um, I'm sure most of you, particularly in this crowd, are aware that uh, there's a lot of concern these days about conservation of po pollinators. Um, uh, even the state of New Jersey has gotten into the uh, act with growing pollinator plants and distributing them to uh, uh, public uh, gardens. And they even uh, are uh, installing pollinator fields in some of their uh, wildlife management areas. So it's become a big thing. And I thought I would just uh, introduce you to the issues underlying the current interest in pollinators and uh, what you might be able to do on your own land, whether big or small. So there are a lot of pollinators of various kinds. Um, when you think about vertebrate pollinators, a thousand species uh, doesn't seem too bad. And there are some surprising ones. Um, on islands, particularly, lizards become important um, pollinators. Uh, we're more used to things like hummingbirds and maybe a bat or two uh, in other areas. Uh, but the, uh, the big <laughs> um, heavy lifting is done by insects. There are 200,000 at least uh, pollinating species of insects, uh, which are extremely important in our various ecosystems. Uh, but why care about insects? Most of people, maybe not so much in this crowd, but in general, most people are afraid of insects. They loathe insects. They couldn't care less about insects. But uh, insects represent about 75% of the Earth's biodiversity. Uh, we think we are important running the world and we make a very big footprint, but insects, which are uh, not as obvious as we are, um, are really much more important. Now, if you look at the figures, uh, there's at least 5 million insects estimated. And when you go down a little further to mammals, we're a pretty insignificant 5,500, at least in terms of numbers. Uh, so insects really uh, have a very important role to play. Uh, in running the Earth's ecosystems. Uh, but there is a uh, phenomenon going on now that's been dubbed the insect apocalypse uh, because there, <laughs> there are um, numerous studies that have documented very serious declines in insects in various places around the world. The first one really that made an uh, 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 impact was one from Germany uh, where on nature preserves, where there has been no habitat uh, deterioration, no pesticide use, they documented a 75% decline in the biomass of flying insects. They were doing uh, periodic um, sampling over three decades. So that was pretty alarming. And other uh, studies like <clears throat> one in Puerto Rico uh, sampled grounded insects and saw an even greater decline. And on the left, you can see a... Uh, a chart of various other kinds of insects in our 
beloved butterflies that are up there at 53% decline, uh, which is really pretty alarming. And insect extinctions are occurring at much faster rate than those of other organisms. Uh, one of the flagship species for this is the monarch. Uh, here they are on their wintering grounds in Mexico. And the uh, uh, area, uh, the, the population is estimated by um, uh, evaluating the area that they occupy on the wintering grounds every year. And this shows a lot of fluctuations, but a very distinct downward trend. And this year, <laughs> there's no exception, they're down to 0.9 hectares, which is about two and a quarter acres occupied. Um, so monarchs may not be in uh, danger of extinction, but their populations are um, rather precarious. But why should we care that all this is happening? Uh, what, what, why are insects important? Well, uh, a very knowledgeable man named E.O. Wilson called them the little things that run the world. Uh, and why? They're very, very important as food for other organisms. Uh, virtually any uh, kind of uh, other organism you can name, um, somewhere in there, there will be an insect eater. And other insects and spiders and other things eat insects. Uh, they are really critical. They're particularly important as <coughs> um, um, food for breeding birds, feeding their nestlings in the breeding season. They're important for our uh, food production too. Uh, many of our, a huge percentage of our crops depend on insects for pollination. Uh, some have to be pollinated, I think like say almonds. Um, others need uh, pollination to increase fruit and seed production to where it becomes um, uh, marketable. And many, many wild flowering plant species uh, also depend on pollination for animals, including insects to develop their fruits and seeds. And this is one you might not think of, but insects are really, really important for breaking down dead matter. Um, if things, animals or plants that died didn't decompose, uh, we would be in deep trouble. Uh, but insects are among the very important organisms, along with bacteria, fungi, et cetera, uh, that do break down dead organic material, uh, important to uh, 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 fertilized soil, for example, and support both crops and native plant communities. So many critical functions and ecosystems are um, uh, portrayed by insects. Okay, why are they in trouble? Um, you can probably guess what's going on in the world when you have forests that give way to freeways when you have prairies or steppes that give way to housing developments, there's no more, uh, no longer any food in terms of native plants uh, for adult insects and their larvae. Uh, there's no more nectar and pollen when wildflower meadows become lawns. Uh, nesting places are critically important. They don't only eat, they, they need special places to breed, often in soil, often in dead wood. And you don't find much of that in housing development. And something we don't think of with all this uh, development, uh, those populations that do remain have great difficulty connecting with each other to uh, maintain gene flow. And to, for example, replenish a population, that, a small population that might wink out. Then changes in agriculture. Uh, long ago, pretty long ago, there were small scale family farms um, where you uh, uh, relatively few acres were devoted to a small number of animals, small number of crops, uh, and there wasn't that big an impact on the environment. Now you have this kind of effect, uh, basically factory farming, where when you have gra grazing animals in particular, um, there's no way uh, many insects are going to survive the grazing and the trampling that this kind of uh, uh, agriculture um, uh, includes. And family farms, they used to have a mosaic of habitats. Uh, in the background, there's a, uh, a, a woodlot, there's a pasture, there's various kinds of crop fields. Uh, and how do we grow crops today? 
This is Nebraska. Uh, and there are here in, in other states in the Corn Belt, millions and millions of acres grown to monocultures uh, that completely obliterate insect habitat. And the crops themselves uh, are, some of them are round, called Roundup Ready. That means they are um, bred to resist herbicides so that they can fly over this field with an airplane and disperse Roundup. And any non-corn <laughs> plant that's trying to grow there will die, but the corn won't. And the, additionally, some crops have um, genetic uh, pesticides uh, resistance um, built into them, or, or rather uh, genetic pesticides, Bt, so that uh, an insect that tries to feed on the corn or whatever crop it might be uh, is killed by that internal um, pesticide. So obviously lots of habitat loss. And we have the unique pesticides, the real, real plague. Uh, they're the most widely used insecticides in the world in at least 120 company, uh, countries. Uh, the vast majority of our corn and soybeans, for example, are treated with neonics. These are systemic pesticides that um, uh, infiltrate the entire plant and um, basically kill anything that tries to feed on it. And of course, very, very widely used on farms, but <laughs> it's available. There are many different kinds of neonics and some of them are available in almost any product you get to control insects in your backyard. And interestingly, the concentrations in those are up to 30 times more uh, concentrated than in agricultural use. So these are you know, not uh, wishy-washy things that you're spraying on your, your roses in your backyard. They are, as I said, they, they're systemic and so they're very pervasive. A co very common thing is to treat seeds with uh, neonics. The plant that grow, uh, the seeds themselves of songbird, for example, eats a treated seed can be fatal. When the plant grows from that seed, the entire plant is permanently infiltrated with um, that with the neonic insecticide. And so anything that feeds on the leaves, on the roots, uh, that takes pollen or nectar from the plant, it's getting the neonic pesticides. Uh, any kinds of fruits that birds might eat uh, are uh, impregnated with it. And it gets into the soil, all the soil organisms and into aquatic systems. So basically neonics are everywhere, killing lots of things. And they're also in your food. It's pervasive on our food supply. Um, huge percentage of corn and canola. The vast majority of tasty, healthy fruits, vegetables, cereals, nuts, neonics. And a few years ago, uh, food samples were taken from congressional dining halls. 90% of those samples were found with neonics and most had multiple kinds of neonics in them. So it's hard to escape them. But uh, uh, an additional problem is that is a synergistic effects with um, the parasites and pathogens that, uh, for, that most insects will encounter in the wild. Uh, and this is particularly a stu study done on bees that basically neonics, um, increase their susceptibility to stressors in the environment, um, such as poor diet or parasites and pathogens. And fungicides, which are also very widely used in agriculture, um, act synergistically to increase the toxicity of uh, neonics. So it's, it's really a vicious circle and bees and other insects are unfortunately in the center of it. Uh, other things, non-native species in the environment. We know there's many of those. They can kill native uh, insects directly. Like my favorite, the uh, praying mantis. Um, or the even more beloved honeybee. Um, everybody loves honeybees, but they are uh, significant uh, competitors for uh, nectar resources with native bees. Invasive species, non-native species, may also directly destroy food sources. Uh, the emerald ash borer has killed millions and millions of ash trees. 
And there are many insects, um, moths, beetles, you name it, that depend on ash uh, as a food source. And those are pretty much gone. The spongy moth, formerly known as the gypsy moth, is a uh, foliage feeder, particularly likes oaks. And most of us have learned from Doug Hallamy's uh, works how important oaks are to native insect species. Um, so uh, all these uh, non-native animal species have um, uh, very unfortunate effects. But non-native plant species are also um, a real problem. Uh, basically, they displace native species that uh, our insects feed on, either on the foliage or on the nectar. For example, gray dogwood is a very nice uh, native shrub species of, used to be of old fields and hedgerows. What do we have now? We have autumn olive, we have maro honeysuckle, we have multiflora rose. Uh, diverse meadows, how many places do you know that have a beautiful diverse wildflower meadows? I'd say on public land, there aren't very many. This is, I believe, Kittatinny Valley State Park, uh, but a place that used to have them, White Lake, uh, they're, they're going to pot very quickly. This is one of the fields on White Lake. It's now a so virtually a solid uh, mass of common mugwort. Gray birch, a nice pioneer species into old fields. Now we have tree of heaven. And very sadly, beautiful, diverse forest herb layers with our beloved ephemeral wildflowers. Garlic mustard is a plant of the day now. So you can imagine so many food sources are just gone for our native insects and populations decline. And perhaps lastly, climate change. Uh, it seems to be pretty obvious that it must be having an effect on insects. The uh, primary or the most important um, element of mortality for insects is desiccation or drying out and certainly um, increased temperatures uh, and uh, long drought periods are probably contributing a great deal to insect mortality. And we've seen some evidence of that here in New Jersey. We've lost a number of butterflies, um, some to rather obvious, um, it seems obvious climate change, take silver-bordered fritillary, which used to occur in large areas of the state and very slowly withdrew to higher elevations uh, until it completely disappeared. And we've also lost Katie and Hare Street, Harris's checker spot, an Arctic skipper, the name alone kind of suggests that that likes cooler temperatures and it only occurred in one very northernmost spot and that's long gone. So these are just some examples of things that very likely were affected by climate change. Another one is monarch. We've always, I've always said even in talks, oh, the big problem is lack of milkweeds in the corn belt. Um, but uh, new studies have shown that the fact that they have to migrate both spring and fall through the Southwest, which has been heavily drought stricken for years, uh, probably prevents them from getting to uh, the wintering ground to begin with. That's why the numbers have plummeted so. And then those few that do get, make it and survive to come back have to go through the same um, habitat again. Uh, so there's a lot of stressors on monarch populations, just one example. So this is all very alarming. And you wonder, okay, is there anything I can do? I own a little piece of property, what can I do to help? Um, because there are still, there's still a lot of insects out there and they're certainly worth trying to help. And one thing, if you have a lawn, get rid of it. <laughs> um, lawns are basically biological dead zones. And look at all the inputs that are needed uh, to keep a beautiful, I'll say quote, beautiful green lawn like this water, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fossil fuels. Um, the amount of fossil fuel used by lawn maintenance equipment uh, in one year was calculated to be, uh, to equal the energy use of um, the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> and air pollution, this is another killer. I didn't realize this. Little, those little uh, gas powered leaf blowers, you know, they not only sound bad, they are horrendously air polluting. And somebody also calculated that using 
a leaf blower for half an hour is the equivalent of driving from Texas to Alaska in a Ford F-150. Pretty nasty things. And time, money, and God knows the noise. Uh, keeping a lawn is just a, uh, uh, it, it requires so much and returns so little to um, insects and other organisms in the environment. Much better, uh, take some of that lawn at least and plant it in flowers, native flowers and shrubs and plants. Um, it'll be much prettier and uh, you will be supporting a lot of insects. Plant a pollinator garden or meadow. Uh, here's Fred Weber's house a few years ago. I've always used this slide as background for um, important elements of a butterfly or pollinator habitat. You need sun, mostly because most uh, insects uh, need, the butterflies in particular need sun. Uh, bees can get along generally with that little less sun. Uh, so it's, that's a little more of a generalist. Uh, but native nectar sources and host plants, uh, moisture and mineral places, basking places, something we don't think of often nesting and overwintering habitat, which I'll talk about in a bit. And of course, no pesticides. They are insects and pesticides are meant to kill them. If you're having such a habitat, of course you want to support all the life cycles. Uh, all elements of the life cycle of the uh, uh, insect. In this turn, in the case of butterflies, you want nectar flowers for the adults, um, host plants for the females to lay their eggs on and to support the subsequent larvae, and also places for them to safely overwinter, as this pupa. A different kind of organism is that you can also um, provide uh, all the life cycle elements for are bees. An example is a bumblebee. Bumblebees overwinter as queens, only the queens um, overwinter in the ground, but not very deeply in the ground. And when spring uh, starts, the queens emerge, they're looking for nectar. So you need to have some nice spring nectar plants like say a red bud, it's up here in the corner. Uh, you wanna avoid using pesticides now because uh, the population is very small. The queen has to build up her workforce uh, once she does that, they're out there foraging in a nice um, array of flowers that hopefully will last from spring through fall. Uh, it's important that you leave some areas for uh, nesting and overwintering, uh, land that's not mowed continually or tilled, uh, leave a lot of down material. If you have a large meadow type uh, habitat, only mow it once in late winter. Um, certainly don't mow it during the growing season. If it's big enough to that you need to burn it to control um, woody vegetation, for example, um, only burn no more than a third of it each year so that there are refugia uh, for uh, some of the insects. And of course, as always, avoid pesticides. Plant native nectar sources. Um, most of you have probably seen this. And, we know milkweeds are probably one of the most common. They're, they're not only for monarchs, they, they're a wonderful nectar plant for a whole variety of, of insects, uh, but there are many others listed here. Uh, don't forget shrubs. We have a lot of beautiful native shrubs and many of them are very important um, uh, nectar sources for native insects. Not a whole lot of trees, but Eastern red bud is important again, because it's one of the first things that's blooming in the spring. We have some red buds and they are covered with bees in the spring. They really appreciate having uh, that early nectar source. And we also have a sourwood <clears throat> tree that blooms in June. Uh, so there's many, many things you can plant for native nectar. Milkweeds, again, there are many varieties of milkweeds uh, and butterflies and many insects love them. Most butterflies love milkweeds. Um, and they're not alone. There's tons of tons of other insects. One study in Ohio found more than 450 different kinds of insects visiting milkweeds. So they are a full service uh, plant for many, many creatures. Uh, some other important summer nectar sources, bergamot, mountain mints are particularly great. Any mints are particularly great for bees. Um, New York ironweed and native thistles. We have 
there's non-native thistles around and they, they provide nectar too, but we have some really nice native thistles that are worth uh, looking up for um, uh, summer nectar plants. And when you get to fall, goldenrods are beautiful and a tremendous nectar source for many, many insects. And asters, same thing. There are asters that grow in woodlands like white wood aster, uh, uh, ones that grow in fields like calico and heath aster. There are wetland orchids, uh, orchids, <laughs> asters, uh, like the winglet aster and purple stemmed aster. Um, so you have a big variety of both color and habitat for planting asters. Now, if you have uh, native caterpillar host plants, they are also important for supporting the population of uh, butterflies and other insects. Um, a relatively limited palette of herbaceous plants, although there are there are multiple uh, species in, in some of these uh, things like grasses and sedges and legumes, of course. Uh, but again, many shrubs are used by uh, insects as uh, the foliage is used for um, to support larvae um, or leaf miners or anything you can think of. And a, very, and a lot of trees. Uh, we don't think of trees particularly as caterpillar host plants, um, but they are. And I'll get back to them in a little bit. Native grasses and sedges. Um, caterpillar food in terms of butterflies for more than 40 species and many, many moths and other critters as well, um, for example. Some of our favorites here. Uh, now, some grasses are not the best for your garden. Uh, better if you have some kind of a meadow that you can let go. But there are very beautiful uh, cultivars of blue stems and uh, switch grasses, for example. Uh, that you can that do make nice uh, garden plants. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to have enough property that you have a hay field, uh, very often hay fields are dominated by non-native cool season grasses that do not do much to support uh, butterflies or other insects. Um, you should go native. Much more interesting looking, isn't it? And there are really some beautiful uh, native grasses uh, that you can populate your meadow with. Native shrubs, if you have them, keep them. Uh, if you don't have any, plant some. Um, this is one of the, uh, the critical needs of uh, 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 providing uh, caterpillars uh, for bird populations. Um, shrubs and native shrubs and trees um, support caterpillars that support birds and on and on and on. Uh, and these are some of the, uh, the common ones that you uh, would do very well. For a prickly ash, you need limestone, but everything else is pretty much um, a generalist species. There, there's a whole big variety, as I listed before, of native shrubs that you can plant. And native trees. Again, as I mentioned, people don't think of trees as caterpillar host plants, but 22 New Jersey butterflies use trees as their host plants. Um, so honestly, you're not going to find a lot of these trees as um, uh, on order, uh, on offer in uh, nurseries, unless you go to a specialist native plant nursery. Uh, but you should be aware of what they are. If you have them on their property, please, please, please keep them on your property. Don't randomly cut down any tree uh, without checking what it is, <laughs> because these they're desperately needed for <clears throat> um, insect and bird support, and also for taking carbon out of the air. And here are the some of the butterflies that use uh, these native trees. And the, you know that's uh, butterflies are only a small part of the equation. There are again countless other insects of many many kinds uh, that need you to provide food and habitat. And it doesn't take much. <clears throat> this is this little corner of our yard that we let go. Uh, and we found out it was full of uh, little blue stem grass, which is one of the best grasses for uh, native insects. Uh, so if you can find, if you have a small property, um, just find out if there are places where um, you really don't have to mow that lawn. <coughs> uh, if you have a place where you can leave bare soil, 
uh, preferably uh, south facing or at least getting uh, being dry and getting good sun, um, that's fantastic habitat for native bees, <laughs> many of which are ground nesting. And they're just really so interesting looking. Um, <clears throat> and very important in your garden, on your property, leave the leaves. Um, insects not only need nectar and foliage, they need overwintering sites. And many overwinter in the leaf litter, in the stems of plants, uh, on the ground. Uh, here um, in this corner where there's a little trellis, I have American wisteria and silver spotted skipper feeds on that. And over the winter, there are pupae on the ground uh, in the litter under there, for example. Uh, and so something else I was going to plant out <laughs> and I forgot. Uh, not many, uh, this is a picture in March when my crocuses were out. Um, not many uh, spring bulbs are very good for pollinators, but crocus is. I see bees on the crocus uh, very frequently. Um, so that's certainly uh, uh, one thing that you can bring a little spring color to your garden, but really important. Oh, and basically what I do, I leave it, I leave the stuff and about this time when the crocuses come up, I start to get a bit antsy at what it looks like. And I start cutting things back very gently and a little bit at a time. And I place it very carefully in a brush pile off in the wood edge. Uh, so that the habitat for anything overwintering in there is not uh, disturbed. I don't rake out those leaves. Um, those leaves are probably full of overwintering uh, propagules. Uh, so this is a very important part of maintaining your property. If you're lucky enough to have a bit of forest, uh, make sure you leave dead stuff. Um, logs, stumps, blow down mounds. This is all prime habitat for insect nesting. We all know like birds like bird, uh, tree cavities. Well, insects do too. And uh, you're also letting things decay naturally into the ground to conserve carbon. Now, <laughs> protect your forest from deer. That's very easy to say. This is the forest behind our house. We, we don't own this beyond this red sign. And it's looked like this ever since we moved in 35 years ago. It's got a beautiful tree canopy of oaks. And practically the only green thing is over here on the right. There's a little bit of Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, that's all because of deer. Uh, and we found that where deer are up to 10 per square mile, you start to use, lose uh, wildflowers. When they get to 20 per square mile, um, you start to lose the shrub layer. And at 30 per square mile, the whole composition of the forest will eventually change as it will here because nothing is regenerating. Uh, there's no tree saplings or seedlings. There's no wildflowers. Uh, there's no shrubs. Um, so it's, you know, beautiful trees, but not much else. And what can you do? You can provide exclosures to keep the deer out and you'll be amazed at what comes up inside the exclosure when the deer can't feed on it. Um, just kind of just don't realize um, that there is a seed bank there and things will regenerate. And if you can hunt yourself or allow hunters on your land, so much the better. Uh, they will like to take out these be a beautiful deer like this 13 point buck we had <laughs> behind our house one year. But you really want to get the does because they are providing the next generation. Alien invasive shrubs and vines are just, they are taking over all our forest uh, floor, our hedgerows, our field edges. Um, uh, Doug Tallamy has a very trenchant figure in his book about oaks that when he studied hedgerows dominated by non-native shrubs, they had 96% less biomass of caterpillars than native shrub dominated hydros, which are incidentally very difficult to find. Um, so these places dominated by non-native shrubs are providing no food for nesting birds. Uh, there's a big hoo-ha uh, these days about um, the decline in, in uh, edge songbirds that inhabit forest edges. 
And it's mostly because of this, the forest edges like right here in the lower right are totally dominated by uh, non-native shrubs, which do not support caterpillars. Uh, our native insects are not evolved to feed on this uh, non-native shrubs. So it's a cascading effect uh, from caterpillars to the birds. So take these out and replace them with native shrubs. Uh, some trees are just as bad. Uh, Norway maple, tree of heaven, which I mentioned before, and this the gallery, uh, calorie pear has become a real curse. Um, planted for ornamental purposes, but it's spreading very widely. And it's, uh, the fruit are spread by birds. So as, as the problem with most invasive species. So just try to take these out, don't plant them to begin with, and uh, you'll be helping the insects out. You can provide a variety of little more minor uh, amenities, such as bare soil for puddling for butterflies and other insects. Anything from bare soil to a little bit of a pond to a pie plate with <laughs> some water and rocks in it. You can see there's a, there's a bee here taking advantage of that. All kinds of insects need water. As I mentioned, desiccation is a real threat to insects. And you'll find if you have moisture around, they're taking advantage of it. If you have to use pesticides, there are less toxic ones out there. Just do not use any of the uh, neonic type of pesticides. Be careful when you buy plants to plant in your garden because the vast majority of plants are they're grown by commercial growers and they use systemic insecticides to keep their plants uh, free of pests, which they consider all insects pests. So you really have to ask when you're going to a nursery to buy plants, have they been treated with neonics? You often get a blank stare, but if you do, go somewhere else. And you, there are many um, uh, resources for learning about pollinators. Uh, Doug Halmy started a whole movement, really, uh, really bringing to the fore how uh, the need for native plants in the home landscape. And he's written several other books besides this. There are many references you can find to um, upgrade your appreciation of insects. Um, most of us are still kind of overcoming um, a hesitance, if you will, to uh, really enjoy something with that many legs. Um, but once you start looking into it, you find their life histories are so fascinating that um, insects just become a really wonderful area of study. And you out in the field when you're looking at butterflies, you'll see so much more as well um, and on your on your own property. So you got to stop thinking picture perfect, like this lawn with no leaves on it, all these non-native boxwoods, shrubs, et cetera, et cetera. Start thinking pollinator perfect. Uh, this is a picture from a number of years ago of Chris and Paula's house. And uh, it's a wonderful array of milkweeds and native uh, black-eyed Susans. And there's a few there's a butterfly bush in there, but what the heck, we have one too. Um, you can do a lot on just say a half an acre uh, with native plants. You can do even more if you have several acres or a meadow. But even if you have no acres, just a deck and a couple of pots, you can plant native plants uh, that will be used by local native insects. And they will all say, thank you for helping us out. And I thank you, that's it. Perfect. Any Perfect. questions? Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, I see we have uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, so I'm just gonna read them. So the first yes. one is, uh, what was the type of wisteria that was growing in Sharon's yard that insects overwinter in the leaves? Uh, that's American wisteria. Uh, the common ones you see uh, in gardens are Chinese or Japanese wisteria, but there's an American wisteria, which is very nice. It's not quite as showy, <laughs> uh, but it does have da dangling clusters of purple flowers are just not quite as conspicuous. And it's a uh, prime food plant for silver spotted skipper. Hmm. 
Uh, the next one I have is, um, it just says that deer have decimated blueberry shrubs in Rifle Camp Park in Woodland Park and Garrett Mountain. I Deer are, yeah, they're not good. <laughs> um, Bob and Kathy Absolutely. say thank you. Uh, Janine says thank you. It was really inspiring. Um, and then actually I, I had a question. So this is something I, uh, I juggle a lot with in terms of... We learn about it um, in any of my graduate courses, um, but it's like a it's a double wielded sword. I think that's the expression. So, keeping leaf litter, I think that's great, and I think it, that is really important. But then, when I'm in class, a lot of the professors say, "No, remove the leaf litter. The leaf litter, the leaf litter is what brings ticks, and that the ticks will overwinter there. They'll attract rodents." Do you think there's a happy medium to this? <laughs> oh my god um you know i do as soon as you start uh promoting a more natural kind of environment environment around your home the first word that comes up is ticks <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> you know, are petrified of them and if you can't live with ticks as well as some of the other critters that are out there. Um, live in an apartment. <laughs> yeah, live in an apartment. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say do a modest amount of clearing. You know, sure, if, you, if your kids are out there playing ball on your back lawn or something, huh. um, Wayne <laughs> is also laughing at the idea of kids playing outside. Um, but sure, you can keep enough lawn to play on and that kind of stuff. But there's always parts of your property where you can leave the litter. Don't just rake it out or blow it out to the curb or put it in bags and have it carted away. Re really save as much of it as you can where you can, um, because there's a lot of life forms in there. I don't oh, know. Yeah, I absolutely. honestly don't know whether ticks overwinter in leaf litter or not. Maybe you do, Jen. Jen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what that's what we've been taught, as well as the other professors that they they specialize more in medical or veterinary. They're, they're the big advocates for taking it. Um, whereas then the uh, like insect ecologists that we have or the agricultural people, they say no, leave it. So it's always just interesting. For me, I, I see that they almost like argue on what, what to do. I believe in leaving the li leaf litter. Um, my advisor tells me no, remove it. But I, <laughs> I believe, I think exactly what you said is good that you, know, you could have it, just be cautious. Like if there are children playing outside, but uh, there are ticks everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, it's going to decompose and yeah. it's going to blow off into odd corners of your property. Um, it will sort of magically disappear over time. You just have to give it a little time. And please don't remove it with leaf blowers. So yeah. it's, it's not only all the other stuff. It does tremendous damage to any critters that are in that leaf litter that you're blowing around, um, even if you blow it into corners. And, you know, it's high pressure air, and it's, it's just not good for anything. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Uh, there are two more questions that have popped up in the chat. Uh, so the first one says, does spring azor use only nanny berry or does it use other vibriums as well? Um, uh, no, it, it uses blueberries and dogwoods and things like that. Okay. Uh, and then this. That was just an example. Um, and then this is if there are any ideas about bringing back the natural fruit shrub fruit shrubs to rifle camp park in garrett mountain we'd all be we'd be grateful thanks Answer. yeah you have to you have to provide deer exclosures and yeah. see what comes up some some things may regenerate on their own uh, some uh shrubs may have to be replanted uh, to bring back a population it's probably more herbaceous stuff that's going to come back. Um, but I, you know, there is a possibility that tree seedlings and shrub seedlings will pop up as well. But it's a deer, deer and invasive species are the two horrendous problems <laughs> facing New Jersey natural habitats, uh, particularly, particularly forested habitats and forest edges. Um, 
And it's a, a very expensive proposition to deal with them on a large scale. Very. But when you when you drive around, come spring, it's all the invasive non-native species that leaf out first. And you will notice every roadside, forest edge, and hedgerow is dominated by those silvery leaves of autumn olive. <laughs> you, that's a particular time when you can really notice it's everywhere um, to our dismay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there any mm -hmm. other questions? If anybody wants to unmute, uh, please feel free. Yeah, I have a question, Sharon. Um, yeah. you, men you mentioned in the talk that the systemic uh, pesticides basically get all throughout the plant, and you said that anything that eats them eventually dies. And you also mentioned 97% of the food in the uh, congressional <laughs> study has uh, pesticides. So. <laughs> are you are you aware of any studies about the effect of these pesticides in the food that it's having on human beings? Um, the only thing I found was that the uh, um, neonics have a, a neurological effect. Uh, basically, in insects, they overstimulate the nervous system, um, and uh, and they have been linked in humans. I've seen some linkage to uh, uh, autistic disorders. Um, that that was the only direct um, effect that I found. Keith, Thank you. Yeah. Um, that 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 uh, the um, high uh, concentration of neonics in congressional food may explain the um, the blank <laughs> stares for Mitch McConnell from time to time, and, and and some of the other strange behavior of our elected officials. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll I'll take note of that. <laughs> First. <laughs> else? We could oh, I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm looking to see anyone else with their cameras on if anyone has anything. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Okay, I think with that we can adjourn. What I'll first do, um, Sharon, are you able to stop the recording? Um, stop share. Yes, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you should have an option, uh, since you're host right now, to um to stop recording. Stop recording. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Let me see. <laughs> oh, I see.